So good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. We hope uh, you enjoy the coffee break. It's now time to move to uh, session two, which is about vectors and biology and pathogen transmission. So with Saskia Hogenhardt from John Heine Center in the UK, Myself from the French National Ag Agronomic Institute, we are very, very happy to chair this uh, session. And just a quick reminder for speakers, you have either 15 minutes or five minutes for young researchers. So maybe um, to keep our schedule on time, we can uh, let you know one, one minute before the end of the time that has been allocated to you that you need to conclude. And uh, we can uh, welcome our first speaker, who is Noemi Cazarin from Université uh, Catholique de Louvain in uh, Belgium. And she will speak about uh, Thalysacea and Afrofruits, which may constitute a new threat pest systems for Europe. So, Noemi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Astrid, for the introduction. So, uh, I will talk about this potential pathosystem combining Salicacea and Afrophoridae for Northern European temperate regions. So, first, I would like to remind that the risk uh, for these regions must not be underestimated. First, by looking to uh, the world distribution of the bacterium, we can see that the bacterium is also encountered in northern latitudes and modeling of the potential suitability um, of uh, different subspecies of Zadella for Europe showed that the subspecies multiplex could, could also find suitable condition in uh, Belgium, in the Netherlands, and in coastal regions of UK and Ireland. So there are other factors to take into account, like homologous recombination, the numerous introductions in Europe, uh, and the fact that potential host plants as well as potential insect vectors are distributed across all the continent and uh, many of them unknown may never have met the bacterium. So the study for the risk for Belgium uh, led us to take an interest in riparian areas. So riparian uh, zones are uh, narrow strips of lands adjacent to rivers and streams and they are uh, important for, uh, for wildlife or if they are habitat for wildlife. Um, in, in, the nine, in the 70s, Purcell uh, observed that the incidence of pure disease was consistently higher um, along the margins of the vineyards um, adjacent to riparian zones. And uh, this was because um, these zones were um, a niche for the blue-green sharpshooter vector. The, the blue-green sharpshooter vector, um, which was naturally infected by xylella because the bacterium could multiply uh, in a variety of plants in these natural environments. So in Europe, riparian areas are also well represented. Uh, I cannot anymore move my slide. I don't know. Uh, sorry, uh, I have a problem. I cannot anymore um, go to the next slide. Could we have some assistance from the technical staff, please? Uh, hi, Noemi. Can you yes. can you click with the with the mouse, or if it oh, is not working, with the keyboard? With the... But it's what I'm uh, here. Here you go. Okay. Yeah, okay. Sorry. All right. Um, so in Europe, uh, we know that these riparian areas are also well represented, and uh, in Belgium too. And in Belgium, we know that uh, potential insect vectors are present in these, uh, in these riparian areas. And so one question that we have is, are there in this, uh, in this uh, zone some plants associated with these insect, uh, potential insect vectors that get, can act as a reservoir? And so it is why we decided to investigate the susceptibility of uh, Salicacea uh, to, uh, to Xylella because willows and poplars are um, typical trees uh, from these uh, riparian areas in our region. So for this, we, um, 
We inoculated four species of salicacea, Salix alba, Salix caprea, Populus tremula, and Populus canescens. Um, and uh, we monitored the, 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 the evolution of the bacterium in the plant at several times, at several months. And nine months after inoculation, the plants were distracted for um, uh, an uh, analysis and uh, confocal microscopy uh, um, was done. And uh, we saw that the bacterium could well establish in um, uh, Populus tremula and also in Salix alba. Um, uh, symptoms could, uh, could clearly be highlighted in Populus tremula, however, not in uh, Salix alba. And uh, this is also an important information, as we know that asymptomatic plants can also play a, an important role in the epidemiology of the disease. So if you want more information on this, uh, this inoculation, I invite you to, to go visit uh, our poster on this work. So in parallel of these plant studies, we also studied the potential insect vectors for Belgium. And so for this, we started for the five potential European insect vector listed by EFSA in 2015. And for these five species, uh, their life cycle, their host plants, their abundance and distribution in Belgium were studied. And so um, because Afrophora salicina was particularly abundant on, um, on Saligacea, uh, we decided to continue the study with these species. Uh, we estimate uh, in certain zone that uh, 600 adults could be um, could be counted on uh, one just one willow of six meter high composed by 1,000 twigs. We also decided to uh, to continue the studies with Phenius pumarius as it was widely distributed across all Belgium. It was polyphagous and um, and because it was also observed uh, observed in riparian zones. So uh, for these two species, we decided to, uh, to carry on um, uh, more studies and uh, to perform dispersal, dispersal studies. So the dispersal studies were done uh, with flight mill uh, methods and with mark release recapture methods. So these uh, two methods have their own bias. Uh, the first one, um, usually overestimate the dispersion capacity, but uh, they, it gives a probability of the, the distribution of flight distances. And mark release recapture experiments uh, usually underestimate the, the, the dispersion capacity, but it's really important to uh, understand uh, behavior of the insect on the field. So these two methods were done at uh, three uh, different times of the season, corresponding in July to the mating season, the mating period, in August to the egg laying period, and in September, which corresponds already in Belgium to the end of life of uh, the insects. So for the mark release recapture experiments, we have done them in two sites, a uh, urban site and a rural site. So a high amount of insects were collected and marked with fluorescent powder. And then they were released from a takeoff platform and their first flight or jump was observed. Then every day of the week following the release, uh, we searched the insect with naked eyes, with binoculars and with sweeping nets and telescopic nets if needed for uh, the trees. Uh, and then one month after the, the releasing, uh, we, uh, we have done one recapture campaign where we were collecting the insect and check them with UV lamp. We also set some traps to try to intercept uh, the insects. And here we see uh, uh, the evolution of the color um, through, the, through time. So uh, for, uh, here is an overview of the results for July for Afrophora salicina. So we circled a zone of 30 meters to better see the results. So here for the, the rural site and the urban site. So um, here on the schematic map, we see the, the green trees are uh, salicacea plants and the blue trees uh, correspond to other trees from other plant families. And the, 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 the dots correspond to the mark to marked uh, insect observation. So we can uh, we can already see a difference between the rural site and the urban site uh, just one day after the releasing with a much more widespread insects in the rural site with some um, uh, found at uh, 40 meters away of the, of the releasing point. And we had no much uh, dispersion in the urban site. And then the dispersion continue and uh, the observation rate decrease 
And uh, seven days after the, the the releasing, we found one at 50 meters of the releasing point, and here for the the urban site, one at 17 um, at, uh, at 31 meters away of the the releasing points. And we saw that the urban site, the um, the the. Um, the expansion seemed to follow the, the willow alignment parallel to the road. So after one month, we just had one observation here. So for, for Philenius pumarius, so the circle zone was uh, 10 meters. And so again, rural sites and urban sites. And here we didn't see much dispersion. They were really uh, staying at the releasing point and then they dispersed a bit. But after seven days, we just uh, uh, found some at 10 meters away from uh, the reason point. And after one month, we could find one 25 meters away from the releasing point for a uh, rural site and for urban site, one at 17 meters away. So th th this was just the, the results for July. But here we can see uh, on this, uh, these graphs, we have an idea of uh, the, the other seasons, uh, the other months, uh, uh, every time for the rural site, the urban site, and the two species. So what is important is that Afrophora salicina dispersed mainly on salic acid plants. Um, the, the third flight of Afrophora salicina could be really important with uh, more than 40 meters in rural sites in July with just one, one flight. And for uh, Philenius pumarius, they were mainly found on uh, herbaceous layer, but also on salicacea and other trees. Uh, they were mostly jumping, so they were never, almost never uh, seen uh, flying. And uh, their first jump was uh, approximately uh, of one meter. And for both species, we did not observe uh, that they cr were crossing the, the main road in the urban site. So now for the um, flight meal. So we collected uh, first wild insects and we identified the, their sex. Then we uh, were um, putting them on a flight meal device. So um, here I have a small video of the flight meal. So we were putting them on uh, for two, hour, uh, two hours and, uh, and 30. And then we were putting them to rest on um, host plants. Uh, for 24 hours and then for the still living insect, we were doing a second flight uh, session of 230. So first the result for the flight rate. So uh, we observed uh, for the first flight much more in Afrophora salicina that were flying than Philenius pumarius. Um, and for both species, the, the, the flight rate was decreasing uh, through the seasons and was higher in uh, July. Um, between first and second fly, we had a, a high mortality of 50% uh, of the insect for both species. And for the flight rate of the second session for both species, it was approximately uh, 40%. So for the distances traveled during 2 hour and 30, we saw a great difference between Afrophora salicina and Philenius pumarius for the, the two sessions, with uh, much more individuals flying further distances for Afrophora salicina. And when we were decomposing the, the results, we could see by sex and uh, by the different periods, we uh, see the, um, the insect that flew the, the extreme values. So for Afrophora salicina, it was one female that flew in August 4.4 kilometers just in 2 hours and 30. And for Philenius pomarius, it was a female in July, uh, which um, uh, perform a distance of 1.5 kilometers in 230. But usually the activity of Philenius pumarius on the flight mill were, um, was, uh, was quite low. So to uh, apply this knowledge to a Belgian situation, so we know that Salicacea are key plants of uh, riparian areas. They are also um, uh, very abundant um, along fields and roads because they, they are used for uh, wind protection. Um, and we know that in these uh, plants and in these areas that there is the presence of potential insect vector. And Alphophora salicina can have really a, a high density of population on uh, salicacea. And dispersion studies 
showed that uh, this inset could act as a long and medium distance uh, connector between uh, these uh, trees and in this, uh, this, all this network. Um, so if Salicase got infected in Belgium, there is um, a risk for Afophora salicina to convey the bacterium on long and medium distances. Um, but Afrophora salicina is oligophagous, so it could seem that the bacterium, bacterium will just stay in this, uh, in this environment. Uh, but in this environment, there are also other uh, insects, potential insect vectors, uh, as uh, Philinus pumarius, which is widely distributed in Belgium. And um, this, uh, this insect in Belgium seems to be a, a more limited dispersal capacity. But uh, because of its polyphagy, it could more locally um, uh, take uh, the bacterium over a multitude of plant species and maybe some economically important. So we don't know, but there are still uncertainties if this stepping stone effect can really occur in Belgium, uh, mainly because we did not test the, the transmission efficiency of uh, the of these insects. But we have here uh, some uh, some elements that uh, show that there is a real potential for uh, the um, uh, a disease uh, spread and uh, and and uh, establishments in our country. So I thank you for your attention. Maybe I thanks one minute left. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> I thank the, the organizer of the conference and all the people that uh, critically contributed to the to this work. So thank you. Thank you very much, Noemi. You are perfect on time despite technical issues. So thank you. <laughs> um thank you so, so <laughs> <laughs> um so we are moving. Moving to our uh, next speaker, who is Martin Godefroy from Instituto de Ciencias Agrarias uh, in Spain. And he is going to speak about uh, species, species distribution modeling, risk assessment, and the mid hospital bug. So, Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Astrid, for the introduction. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, perfectly. Okay, good. You should, yeah. Um, good. So, good evening, everybody. Uh, I thank the EFSA to me the opportunity of giving this talk. Uh, the goal of the study I will present was to predict the spatial distribution of the middle spital bug, Philanus pomarius in Europe. I focus on this species because it's, um, it's the main vector of Zileda in Europe, and I believe it's an important topic uh, because it will help at assessing risk of Zileda understanding of the Zilela screen in Europe, designing control and monitoring strategies, and forecasting the response of Zilela epidemiology to ongoing climate change. So as you can see on this map, Philanus has a wide distribution. The species is currently distributed in Europe, in North Africa, in Asia, in North America, and New Zealand, and Hawaii Island. Uh, Philanus sumarius has a complex phenology. It's a univoltine species, which means there is only one generation per year. Uh, the species overwinters as eggs and spends spring as larvae. The, the, the adults usually appear uh, in late spring or, or early summer. They will reproduce in summer, and, and ov the females oviposite eggs uh, at the end of summer or, or in early fall. So all the population display this kind, this typical phenology. However, the duration of the different life stage uh, is variable and depends on local climate conditions. Despite this, the phenology seems apparently only moderately plastic, as this is a complex biological cycle involving uh, an obligatory ovarian parapause, which means there is a time necessary for exmaturation during summer and the winter diapause. So to answer my question, I use uh, correlative species distribution models. Uh, these models are a statistical approach that establish a mathematical relationship to estimate the probability of presence and absence of a species in function of climate covariates. So to fit this model, you just need um, two kinds of data, climate data and distribution data. 
These tools are now widely used in ecology and may serve to forecast the range of invasive species, predict response of species to climate change, or just to understand uh, the biology of the species. So I first collected uh, presence data from all possible sources. I collected uh, an amount of 17,443 records, uh, most of them situated in Europe and North America, and I also get some records in Asia. Uh, I, clean, I first cleaned this data set by removing duplicated, uh, ambiguous, erroneous uh, records, and also presumably microclimatic related uh, presents. To, uh, uh, sorry, I will add something. Um, so as you can see in North America, uh, the middle of Peterburg is particularly abundant in Pacific coastal region and in Northeastern USA, where the species was considers, uh, considered as the best. And conversely, the species is apparently absent from Southeastern USA and, and is scarce in dry region of Central and Western North America. And in Europe, uh, the middle of Peterburg is a common and abundant species in humid regions and is scarce in dry regions and at high altitudes. To describe the climate conditions uh, experienced by the middle of Spittelberg, uh, I extracted high resolution worldwide climatic clusters from the CHELSA database, which reflect average climate conditions for the period 1979 to uh, 2013. I extracted vector describing the mean temperature of the warmest quarter of the year, so it's summer temperature. Uh, it was a, a good proxy to get some temperature trends. And besides this, I calculated an index of moisture for the warmest quarter of the year and the coldest A month period of the year. Uh, this moisture index calculation was based on rainfall and potential evapotranspiration. And it, was, it is an index ranging from minus one for very arid climate conditions to plus one for very humid uh, conditions. To model the distribution of filaments, I use four kinds of regression and machine learning techniques, namely Maxen, boosted regression trees, uh, multivariate ad adaptive regression splines, and generalized additive models. So for time constraint, I want to give details on statistics involved in these different techniques. I fitted the models. Uh, I fit the models using 80% of data and kept 20% of data to evaluate the predictive power of models using uh, the area under the curve of the receiver operating ca characteristic curve, uh, which is the most common evaluation matrix used in species distribution model. And I and I perform five repli replicates of each model. In model calibration, uh, I, the presents were discriminated against 20,000 background poems uh, randomly generated in North America and Europe. Uh, these poems are localities where we do, we do not have information on the status of the species, and this mainly reflects the full climatic domain available for the species in, in both continents. Uh, there is some important point on this. In North America, as you can see on the map, I decided to generate backbone points in the same latitude range of prisons situated in Europe to avoid uh, issue associated to interaction between photo period and warm temperatures, uh, which is a common issue, or it's a common interaction in species with a strict phenology like Philanus and occurring in temperate regions. So I will show you now the results of the models. Uh, so first, for all the models, the index of moisture related to summer uh, had extremely low relative contribution uh, in, and importance in the model, suggesting this it is not a main constraint for the species. And act, it's actually not surprising because Philanus can, we found Philanus in region uh, with extremely dry summers, so it's not a surprise. However, the most moisture index for the coldest eight-month period of the year had strong importance in models. And I show you on this slide the plots of the predicted uh, response of models to this moisture index. And as you can observe, all the models suggest there is that probability of the probability of presence uh, increase when moisture index increase. And this, this is not surprising, again, because all the field observation and all the experiment, experimental data 
suggests that eggs and nymphs of Philaenus are extremely sensitive to climate and particularly sensitive to moisture and to humidity. So for all the species, for all the specialists of the species, actually, uh, moisture condition during development period of eggs and nymphs is, is crucial for survival of the species. And re regarding nymphs, the effect of moisture can be direct or, or, and also indirect via edric status of the plants on which they feed. On this slide, I show you the response curve to temperature predicted by models. And so all the models identify a negative effect of low temperatures on probability of prisons. Uh, this could explain why the species is absent from high altitude regions and extremely north area of North America uh, that might not be warm enough for the metabolism of the species. Uh, there is, a, however, some uncertainty on the impact of high, high temperatures uh, on the species. And the models gave slightly different outputs. Some models predict a decrease of probability of presence when temperature increase, while others identify a kind of constant response. So actually, uh, uh, after a close inspection of data and distribution data, uh, especially in Europe, uh, I did not find a, clearly, a clear signal of a negative effect of high temperature. Uh, for example, in Europe, Philanus primarily is present in the warmest region of Europe, uh, some, of, some region of Greece, Turkey, and Spain. Uh, and this could suggest that when moisture levels are fine for development of eggs and nymphs uh, during fall, winter, and spring, Philanus can likely establish in extremely warm region, uh, presumably thanks to its plastic phenology and adaptive behavior. So given this important observation, I suggest that the output uh, provided by boosted regression trees were, are the most conservative because they do not infer a, a high decrease of suitability at high temperature. And this, is, this, this model is not prone to underestimate risk, which is a desirable characteristic of models when we deal with uh, pests. So that's why I will show you the results of this particular model now. So I will show you now the, the most important output, uh, the map of predictions. Um, so as, as you can observe on this map, uh, most of Europe and Mediterranean region is, uh, is unsuitable, but we, there are strong differences in predicted suitability, uh, particularly some region of the Iberian Peninsula, uh, Turkey and Eastern Europe uh, are predicted uh, as less suitable. Obviously, when, when observing this map, you, you will wonder if you can trust this prediction. So I, I would like to highlight a couple of points about this. First, I show you here, um, I would like to highlight that this, this prediction fits uh, pretty well abundance patterns uh, observed in the Iberian Peninsula. So I get data from sampling survey performed by, by my team in Spain, by uh, for protection agencies um, and research institutions. And I identify on this map with a red circle, for example, a region we sample that were sampled and we, where we observe a high ab abundance of fillings. And as you can see, uh, all these regions are, are predicted as highly suitable. And conversely, I identify some region with black circles and all this region so in this region, Philanus also is present, but in general, we observe uh, lower densities. And it, this comes also from some, uh, this information comes from sampling surveys and scientific literature. So the prediction match uh, fit well abundance we observe, abundance data we, we observe in, in Spain. And I would like also highlight that uh, this prediction match very well uh, with uh, xylella outbreaks occurring uh, in Europe. So as you can see on the map, a uh, region experiencing several outbreaks and high transmission rates uh, are, predicted, uh, are predicted as highly suitable. It's the case of Balearic Island, uh, the Alicante region in Spain, 
uh, north of Portugal, uh, Corsica, southeastern France, uh, Apulia, and also Tuscany, even if Tuscany has a, a, a bit lower uh, probability. And my, I think it's not uh, probably not a coincidence. So the conclusion of this work are the following. Uh, all European regions are likely not equally climatic suitable for this vector. And this model I just present to you is uh, constitute a promising proxy to estimate abundance patterns of spilling spomarius in Europe. And I believe this it's an important information to to account for in, in risk assessment and also in, in research projects. I, I just would like to, to conclude, I would, I, would, I would like to warn some, some caution when interpreting these maps. First, as I told you, there is still some uncertainty about response to high temperatures. Uh, I remind that these tools are correlative approach and that distribution data of species are influenced by many other factors than climate, like uh, competition, predation, availability of uh, host plants, related to human activity. So it's one of the weakest of this kind of uh, tools. These models are just a macroclimatic proxy at continental scale. So it's a simple picture of, uh, uh, of the distribution of Philanus and the reality is much more complex. And also, and I really, I will, I want to really insist about this. Uh, low predicted climatic suitability does not mean there is no risk. Uh, it just means probably the climate is less suitable for, for, for the species. And I insist that population of freelancers can can are present in dry regions uh, when plant cover is uh, suitable. Plant cover is available because the plant plants can provide most uh, microclimate condition for, for names. So that's a fundamental aspect we have to account for in, uh, in this kind of prediction. And that's why we need to be uh, cautious with this kind of, of maps. And the last thing is, of course, there are other vectors to account for in further in, in models and risk assessments. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for this interesting talk. So uh, this time I did not forget to turn on my camera. <laughs> Sorry about that. So we are moving to a first uh, question and answers session. So maybe the first question is for Noemi. So Noemi, all the attendees are very, very enthusiastic about your talk. And <laughs> they have some questions for you. Uh, um, the first yes. of which is, uh, did you ever see any Philenus primarius feeding on grape wine? And if yes, what was it a frequent behavior? Um, yes, we did. So uh, when we were doing uh, the, the distribution uh, um, assess of the of, uh, Philenus primarius in uh, in Belgium, we also uh, checked on um, uh, vineyards. We don't uh, in in Belgium vineyards are not uh, really abundant, but there are some, and now the activity is starting to 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 really uh, in, um, uh, increase. Uh, and in these vineyards, the biological vineyards, we found some uh, Philenus that were feeding on vines, and. Uh, I cannot say that it was, uh, I don't know, frequent or, or, or some, something like that, because we, we haven't uh, sampled all the, the vineyards in Belgium, but in, uh, in some of them, we could find Philenius. Yes. Okay. I don't know if I answered and, the question. Uh, maybe yes. Well, the idea is that uh, we will try to answer to some of them, and then, mm -hmm. if we don't have time to answer to all questions, we will uh, answer them by writing. So that, that's the idea. So maybe maybe a, a second one, because we have yeah. a little time. So there is a, an attendee who is uh, curious about what do you mean when you talk about uh, mating season? Because uh, yeah. Philinus primarius females are receptive to mating signals in the late summer or in autumn. And do you know? 
example, when Afrophora Salicina achieve mating in the field? Yeah. Yes. Um, so for mating period, so yes, the, the mating period is until uh, can uh, go through all uh, the season. But here we wanted really to uh, distinguish this mating period with the beginning of the egg laying period. So it's that 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 I wanted to to mean for a mating period. So uh, when this egg laying period and mating period period are not together, and for Afrophora salicina, uh, the mating period would be uh, in uh, July, and then after uh, after this, um, we we saw egg laying um, ap appearing. So because the, the Afrophora salicina leg uh, eggs uh, lay eggs. Uh, really on the the twigs of the of uh, salix, so we can really see them. And so uh, from this time, the, the egg laying period um, starts, but uh, we still have mating period uh, coupled of this egg laying period. So. Okay, thank you. Maybe now to Martin. So uh, there is a question about. Um, through absence. So people are wondering how the model uh, managed the, the true absence or how, how this uh, absence are taken into account and what about absence that are due to uh, sampling back, for example. Something what? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. So there, there, there is somebody who is saying that um, is the lack of occurrence in some areas body looking rather than a true so sampling bias yeah 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 and of course, if so of course. do you model take into account that or not yeah so that's one of the weak nerve or that's one of the of the factor we have to to consider when interpreting the maps uh it's very difficult to get true absent from the species and and to access in function of the covariate the climatic covariate that I included in the model so that's why I decided to use a quite uh, uh, a conservative approach and I, I generate points in both continents. Uh, and I expect that the model will, will be discriminate the probability of presence in function of all this climatic space. Um, so actually I decide, for example, uh, Philene was is absent from Southeast uh, USA. And it was difficult to, to know if I, I have to put absence there or not, because it could be, my hypothesis, for example, it could be an interaction between temperature and photo period. So that's why, for example, I decide to just uh, put my absence uh, in highlighted uh, of USA. And of course, uh, this model, that's this model, give a probability of prison, but, but we never know that. That's why we use actually a, a, a huge number of uh, absence or background forms, we call that, uh, to, and the model uh, estimate the probability of presence in function of every, all the climatic space available, but we have to interpret this with caution, of course. And so maybe another question so on, on the slide you presented you showed only the outcome of the model for the Mediterranean areas and yeah. so there are uh, somebody who is asking for prediction for the prevalence in northern Europe uh, North Europe is, is, ex uh, is extremely suitable and actually the, I have a cluster of, of prisons there in, in that's why I just uh, show the Mediterranean region because it was the region, but it's the, the region where Xilela is, uh, is, is uh, a big problem uh, currently. And also there was, uh, there was strong differences in suitability in Northern Europe, except high altitude region uh, of Scandinavia, uh, all, the other region, all the other regions uh, are extremely suitable. And, and so, maybe two quick questions in the last minute. Um, so first to Martin, did you account for moisture from irrigation or only natural precipitation? No, only uh, the, the moisture index was calculated based on rainfall uh, and potential evapotranspiration. 
which is a function of temperature, solar radiation. Uh, no, I did not account for irradiation, and it's another, of course, that's that's why I say the a log probability does not mean no risk, because if we have a, I don't know, a vineyard or, or an olive grove with irrigation or, or, or other crop with irrigation, we could uh, we could observe a population of Elenus because it will take advantage of that. So that's why we again it's a macro climatic uh, output, and we we need to interpret this with caution. And the last one for Noemi, did the herbs get dry during your samplings? Um, we had so the, the two sites, uh, for one of them, the, the, the urban sites, the, the herbs did not dry at all. And for the rural site, we observed some drying, but not all the herbs at all. But it was uh, in August, it was uh, really hot. Uh, this year, and so some of the herbs had dried, but they were still herbaceous layer, uh, green herbaceous layer uh, on uh, on the sites. So, okay, th thank you, thank you to both thank of, you. of you for your nice contribution. You. So we will have a five minute thank short break, and we go back for the next part of the session. I'm really happy to uh, uh, announce the next uh, few speakers. I'm. Uh, the co-chair with Austrit. I'm Saskia Okuna at the John Innes Center. I'm really uh, excited to uh, uh, introduce the next two speakers. And we are wonderful in time, so hopefully you'll keep to that. And uh, with the first speaker is uh, Mark Sisteron at the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Agriculture Research Service in the U.S. And Mark is going to talk about spread of Cellella frostiosa by the classy wing sharpshooter in the San Juan Valley of California. I'm looking forward to the talk, Mark. I'm not sure if I'm hearing Mark. No, Mark, we can't hear you. Yes. Maybe you should unmute yourself. Yeah, I see. We see your slides, so that's great. Okay, hold we on. We can't hear you. I am unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, brilliant. Okay, uh, just need to put your slides on presentation mode. Um, you had that previously. Yep. yep, I got it. Yes. All right. Brilliant. Okay, you can hear me then. Good. Yes. All right. Well, I, I would like to thank you for inviting me to speak. I, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to give this talk. And, and at the start, I, I would like to note there's a number of co-authors here. Um, and th this is a project that definitely involved teamwork. And I am very appreciative of my co-authors for providing me their, their sort of expertise and their time to get this project finished. So we're going to talk about um, the spread of Xylella fastidiosa in grapevine in California by the glassy-winged sharpshooter. So if we're talking about Xylella in grapevines, we're talking about Pierce's disease, um, and that we also need to bring a, a second crop into the conversation because one, one of the commonalities of a lot of Xylella systems is the movement, movement of vectors between sort of the crop of interest and some sort of source habitat. In the case of the glassy-winged sharpshooter, that alternative habitat is citrus. Uh, one, one of the things I want to emphasize is that uh, while there are strains of Xylella fastidiosa that are found in citrus, none of those strains are currently found in California. So that citrus orchards serve as a source of vectors, not necessarily inocula. That's not to say that there couldn't be weeds in citrus orchards that serve as hosts of Xylella, but the actual citrus plants themselves um, do not. So that if we want to think about where glassy wing sharpshooter might be a problem, we're aware that uh, citrus is an important overwintering habitat and reproductive habitat that, that the sharpshooters are often found in large numbers in during the winter, and then they move out. Uh, then they move out uh, in, into the vineyard in, in the spring. So, so if we want to think about where there might potentially be problems with xylella as caused by the glass ceiling sharpshooter, is we want to look in areas where there's a great citrus interface. Um, it's also important to note that, that the glassy wing sharpshooter is an invasive vector. Um, it was first believed to arrive in California in the late 1980s um, in, in this area here, which is Ventura County. One of the things you can note in this map is that uh, plantings of grape are col colored in purple 
plantings of citrus are colored in green and areas that have a significant overlap of citrus and grape are colored in red. Well, the, the area was first observed in, you can see, it is all green. There's no grapes there. We don't have any xylella strains in the citrus. So it wasn't really a problem for the citrus growers uh, in, in that area. So when it was first observed, it was just uh, so, sort of a casual observation and, and, and the sort of the, the scale of the problem wasn't recognized until glassy wing sharpshooter moved into areas that had both citrus and grape, which first happened in this area here in Temecula. And it's a fairly small area. And you can see that there, there's just a touch of red right there where there's a significant overlap with grape and citrus. And there was an epidemic of Pierce's disease in the late 1990s there. And then just behind that was another epidemic in this area here of Kern County, which is the location I'm going to be primarily talking about today, which has another splash of red uh, where there was another epidemic of Pierce's disease in the late 2000s. In response to those epidemics, uh, an area-wide control program was initiated. And this area-wide control program relied on two things. Uh, one, gathering information on the distribution and abundance of glass ceiling sharpshooters by collecting sticky trap data. So if you drive around the agricultural fields in these regions, you will see yellow panel sticky traps on just about every corner. Uh, so that real-time information on glass ceiling sharpshooter abundance was present. And then area-wide applications went on, predominantly treating citrus to knock down those overwintering populations. Um, and this area-wide program was very successful for a period of about five, five to eight years. And there's recently been uh, an another epidemic. Um, and if we can sort of look, look and see what happened, uh, what I've got here is trapping data for the, for the particular area that I, that, I, that I was working in that I requested from the California Department of Food and Agriculture that covers the period of 2001 up until uh, 2017. So what we've got then here is on the x-axis is just year, and then on the y-axis is the average number caught per trap per year. And the trapping in this area started shortly after the start of the area-wide program, which is why the trap numbers are fairly low. Um, and there was a period of time in which almost no sharpshooters were observed in this area, and the population started to increase again around 2009. It wasn't really around 2015 until 2015, again, that, that the scale of the problem they were having was recognized. And that's actually the first time that I went down to this area uh, where we saw a lot, a lot of sharpshooters in vineyards. It was, it was really quite bad. Um, and we put together a research plan to get started in uh, 2016. Um, we knew going in when we started this project that, that control in this area for the sharpshooters was going to be very aggressive and that there was a limited amount of time that we might be able to collect data before the sharpshooter populations were knocked out. But we did manage to get one very good year of data in 2016 and at least in the citrus, sorry, in the vineyards we were working in in 2017, by 2017 they had managed to, to knock those sharpshooter populations out. They managed to do the same thing in the conventional citrus in that area, although sharpshooter populations did persist um, in organic citrus. Uh, the, the, the one other thing I, I would like to mention too is that this, you know, al along with uh, aggressive insecticide control, uh, there is also active roguing going on on these fields in an attempt to remove as many infected vines as possible. Um, and in some cases that, that did affect some, some, some of the decisions we made on how to approach research. So uh, we, we saw this as an opportunity to, to really answer the, uh, a question of, of when does vine to vine spread of xylella and grapevines occur? And, and I basically broke this down into sort of three sub questions. The, the first one being, in order to have vine to vine spread, uh, the infected vine has to be in the right state for a vector to acquire from it. Uh, so we, we do know that a, a, a vine that's infected um, over the course of a season, that xylella population in the vine fluctuates and moves around in the, in, in the plant so that there might be certain times of year where acquisition is more likely to take place than other times of year. Similarly, not only do the plants have to be in the right state for acquisition, you also have to have um, vectors in the vineyard. So the second part of it is, well, when, when are the vectors abundant in the vineyard? And then the third part is putting those two pieces of information together is when are the vectors actually inoculative? So to address the first question of when are chronically infected vines likely to be acquisition sources, our, our basic um, idea going into this was that uh, 
it seems that vectors are more likely to be able to acquire xylella if you can detect xylella using PCR from that plant than if you can't. And so what we wanted to do was basically identify a set of vines in late summer of the first year of the study uh, so that we knew they were infected going into the following season and then basically collect leaf petiole samples from those plants all throughout the following summer to look at our ability to detect xylella in the, those vines that we knew were infected. We, we did actually successfully, we were successful in, in getting that data for some vines, but however, what happened a lot was we'd go into the vineyard with the vines that we had identified in September and uh, uh, the brower in those fields also identified the same vines and they all got pulled out. Um, so what we, in that, that case, what we did was then looked around for vines and areas that had heavy roguing that were displaying early season or early season symptoms of Pierce's disease. And I have some pictures of those to show you as well. And we also followed um, some vines that were heavily pruned. So th th these are vines that rather than roguing and removing the entire vine, uh, the grower basically just came in and cut it off at knee height. Uh, those stumps would push uh, fresh green growth in the spring and we collected plant material from those plants as well. Brought, the, brought it all back to the lab um, and did quantitative PCR. Uh, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, this is a set of vines that we had identified as being infected in 2016. Uh, the infected vines are these ones here. You can see that, that the amount of growth on them is not as much as the ones that go down farther down the row. This is what those vines looked like in June. Uh, here they are in July. Uh, same vines in October, they look quite bad now. And at the end of the season, the, the grower did go ahead and remove those. Uh, this is an example of what I was referring to on, on trying to find plants based upon early season symptoms. So in this particular vineyard, we, we had identified plants that were infected the previous year. We came in, they were all gone. Uh, we walked around that area and we noted that there was a number of vines that had de delayed growth compared uh, delayed growth compared to the vines neighboring them. And if we look around at the other vines that are here, they look a lot more like this one than they do this one. And this is also a section of the vineyard that was heavily rogued. Uh, this is, uh, I got a series of pictures of the same vine. So this is what that vine looked like in April. That same vine in June, you can see that, that there's not a lot of clear foliar symptoms on that vine uh, towards the end of June. When we get into July, we can start seeing some symptoms um, in the canopy. Uh, in August, we can still see a little bit. Uh, we're in later August, you're starting to see more symptoms. And by the end of the season, you know, the vine looks quite bad. And just for comparison, if you want to know what a set of healthy vines from the same vineyard looks like, I mean, vines at the end of the season in, in this area don't look particularly good because the sun burned in dust, but they certainly don't look quite this bad. So we collected leaf petiole samples every three weeks throughout the summer. And so what we've got here on the x-axis is our sample collection date. And on the y-axis is the proportion of samples collected on that date that were PCR positive for xylella. We've got this for our heavily pruned vines, the vines we had confirmed as being positive in the previous year, the vines in which we were relying on early season symptoms. And, and the overall pattern between the three types was fairly similar um, in that we generally didn't start detecting xylella until July uh, with detection peaking in August and September. So with regards to the, the next question is, when are sharpshooters abundant in vineyards? As I indicated earlier, uh, th there is a lot of yellow panel sticky trap data that's available. Um, and so I requested that from the field sites that I was working in. In addition, we also went in and did uh, timed visual observations where we searched the vines for two minutes, looking and counted the, the number of adults, nymphs, and glassy wing sharpshooter eggs we saw on that two minute period. Uh, on the left here, what we've got then is the results for the visual counts. On the right is the uh, sticky trapping data and the patterns are fairly similar. Um, and generally what we see is that you have bud break around April. And at that point, the sharpshooters move out of the vineyards and in, in, I'm sorry, out of the citrus and into the vineyards. Uh, it's typical in this area for a treatment of imid imidacloprid to go on uh, around bloom. Uh, this was put on in both of these vineyards. Uh, the number of sharpshooters in those vineyards then declines throughout the summer. Uh, vineyard B did receive a second neonicotinoid application in June, which uh, Vineyard A did not receive. Um, and then later in the year, around about August, uh, those populations in those vineyards uh, sort of popped back up again. And we saw the same trend in both our visual observation data um, 
and in the trapping data. So there really appears to be two periods of sharpshooter abundance between bud break and then a midacloprid application going on. And then uh, late in the season, presumably when those insecticides have worn off enough for the, the sharpshooters to survive within the vineyard. So uh, then the final question is putting the two pieces together is when are inocular sharpshooters present in vineyards? And to, to address this question, uh, what well, we went into vineyards and conducted 20 minute searches for sharpshooters and collected as many adults as we could in that period. Uh, we did this every three weeks, um, brought them back to the lab, cut off their heads, uh, ground them up and did quantitative PCR. I recognize both of these pictures in the bottom of our citrus. Uh, we, we, we did this in vineyards, conventional citrus orchards, and organic citrus orchards. For the sake of time, I'm going to lim limit the discussion to just the vineyard results. Um, and this is what we ended up seeing. So what we've got here is basically the date the sample was collected. Uh, and then we've got the total number of sharpshooters collected with the black dots. And then the number that were uh, PCR positive for Xylella represented by the white dots at vineyard A, vineyard B, and vineyard C. And then the, the, the final panel here is just at each one of those sites is what, what percentage of sharpshooters were positive. And really what we can take out of this is that there weren't very many positive sharp, or there weren't any positive sharpshooters early in the season. How many that, left? Uh, mm -hmm. what, what was that? Excuse me, one minute still. So one minute, one okay. Minute. Okay, I will go quickly. So, 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 uh, uh, so when is vine to vine spread most likely to occur? That period is most likely to be July through September. Uh, what I've got here is I overlay trapping data for over an 18 year period for this area. If um, we see the highest level of abundance typically with the trapping data in this July through September period, that's also the period in which the vines start to test positive for xylella. And just behind that is when the vectors start to test positive as well. So this period of July through September appears to be very important, but if we pull insecticide records for that area, and so what we've got here is on the x-axis is basically month, and then the percentage of vineyards in that area that were reporting an insecticide treatment that might be active against glassium and sharpshooter. What we can see is that late season period is the only period in which the vineyards aren't being protected by some sort of insecticide treatment. So to conclude, uh, primary sp spread might, may occur between bud break and that initial imidacloprid ap application. It, it is interesting to note here that, that glassoene sharpshooters overwinter as adults, so it is entirely possible for them to acquire xylella from a vineyard in September, move into citrus where they overwinter, and then actually move back into that same vineyard um, in the following spring, which, which is where they had acquired xylella from. Secondary spread appears to occur during the period of July through September. This is a period when insecticides are not typically applied. There's two reasons for that at least. One of them is the post-harvest interval. That's the period of time in which harvest usually takes place. And there are uh, regulations on when you can apply products relative to harvest. Uh, the, the, the other one is winter curing, is that uh, there is a phenomenon referred to as winter curing that takes place in grapes where vines can cure during the winter if the temperatures are cold enough. And it's believed that vines um, inoculated very late in the season are more likely to cure. However, there's very little data on overwinter curing in this particular location. And the little bit of data that is available suggests that rates of winter curing in that particular location might be quite low. Um, and just to sort of, sort of conclude, you know, th things that we need to get better control uh, being able to identify infected vines very quickly. You know, the one thing that we saw is that we had a grower that was trying to rogue, and they did, and then we'd be able to come, um, come in right after them and be able to find more. The second is that all of these insecticide applications have resulted in, in, in uh, uh, a potential risk for resistance, and glass wing sharpshooters are showing signs that they are becoming resistant to these commonly used products which really means we're in a position where we desperately need alternative control technology that's sustainable for controlling glass wing sharpshooter populations. And with that, I would like to thank my, my funding agency um, and a number of technicians. And I think I'm out of time, so I, I will stop there. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Thank you for this interesting talk.
Um, um, yes, yeah, so I will swiftly go on to the next speaker and your your, your you will have questions to answer at the end of uh, this two, two talks, okay? So uh, the next talk is uh, from Miguel Angel Miranda from the University of Balearic Islands in, uh, in Spain. And uh, Miguel is going to talk about understanding the epidemiological role of the Fretaposilla la fastidiosa in the Balearic Islands in Spain by long-term microcosm and microcosm studies. Miguel, the yeah. floor is for you. Uh, thank you very much, Saskia. Just confirm, please, that you hear me well. Yes, here I hear you fine, and your slides also shows. Uh, okay, thank thank you very much, Saskia. So uh, thank you all of you that are attending this this talk, and it's really a pleasure to to have the opportunity to present this talk here in this third uh, EPSA conference on Shalela. Uh, well, you know that the Balearic Islands became very famous in 2016 because of the detection of Shalela fastidiosa in the island of, of Mallorca. And from that, from that detection in 2016, the um, bacteria was also in the other islands, for example, here in Menorca and in Ibiza. As you know, the diversity of Shalela fastidiosa in the Balearics is quite complex in the sense that there are several subspecies and sequotypes in the island. And due to that situation, and also because there was really a lack of knowledge about the vectors in the archipelago, EFSA launched a, a, a grant. And you can see here the title of the grant, what was collection of data and information in Balearic Islands on biology of vectors and potential vectors of Shalela fastidiosa. And you can see on this slide, the different teams that are participating in this grant, people from uh, UIB, uh, people also researchers from Scotland, from SASA, um, the researchers also from FTSEIC, Alberto Ferreres in Madrid, and also we have always the support of the of scientific officer Evelina Chevinchek from EFSA. So very briefly, I, I um, pay attention just to the bold uh, sentences here, which is a summary of the results. So the, the oh, sorry of the objective. So the first objective is basically dealing with the microcombs. The second objective is dealing with the microcombs. And then we have also a proposal for sampling protocols would be the third objective. And the fourth objective deals with the transmission or uh, assays for the different vectors that we can found in the Balearic Islands. Also, please take into consideration that after me in a while is Sofia Delgado coming with a talk about DNA, but you know, the vectors in the Balearics and there are two posters. One of them dealing with the sticky traps as a protocol for sampling. And also another poster from uh, Julia Lopez dealing with the results of the transmission assays. Uh, I'm going to focus just on objective number one, which is the macrocons, and objective number two, which is the microcons. So for the macrocons field observation, what we basically conduct is a sampling of the vectors in different dots in Mallorca, Minoca, and Ibiza. In Mallorca, we conducted the uh, sampling from January to December, that means annually, while in Menorca and in Ibiza, the samplings and for Mentera, the samplings were only twice per year during two or three days in uh, the number of plots that are indicated in the different islands. So for the sampling of the insects, we just adapted the previous protocol that was available from Domenico Bosco that also had a grant from EPSA. So we adapted the uh, protocol from uh, Dr. Uh, Domenico Bosco in, in, the different, in the different crops we were sampling that were basically uh, almond, olive trees, and also bangers. So we were using for the NIMS a framework of this surface and for collecting the adults, we were collecting from the, from the plant cover from the trees and also for the border of the orchard with a sweeping net. I'm starting already with the results of the macro -coms. and you can see here the results from NIMF. In this case, the results show that the NIMFs are found on the field basically from March to April until May, sometimes um, until June, and sometimes we can also 
uh, not in this case, but in other plots we were working with, uh, in February, late February, you can also detect some of the names. So as you can see here, I'm comparing all the time the two major or the two main species uh, found in the Balearics, which are Philenus spumarius and Philenus campestris. And you can see from here that they both show the same, more or less the same pattern, and the names are found on the field at the same time. In regards to the development of the NIMS in, um, on the field, you also can see here on this graph that the pattern is very similar. Uh, they present overlap uh, nymph stages, the both species, both Philenus spumarius and Neophilenus campestris. They, we can find N, N1 to N5 in the different uh, weeks we are sampling. And of course, the proportion of N5 stages increase as uh, the month of the summer comes. Um, there are also um, differences in the host preference. Um, as you probably um, know, Philenus spumarius is a vector which is uh, very polyphagous, so we can find it in uh, many different plant families. Meanwhile, Neophilenus is quite a um, um, non-polyphagous insect in the sense that the nymph just develop preferently in just one family or few. You can find it all, sometimes in other families, but very, very in a minor proportion. They develop mostly in the poas. For the adults, what we can see here is the uh, whole seasonal pattern for the adults, considering all the Afrophoridae, not distinguishing between species. Here uh, on the y-axis, we have the density of insert per sweeping net. And here you can see that there are two peaks of the adults in the vegetation, uh, in, particularly in the cover vegetation, one in the spring and another in autumn. We find also a peak of adults in the canopy, particularly in the spring, summer. And in full summer, we find also a peak of the insects, adults in uh, the border plants, the plants that are located at the border of the plots. But if we look more carefully to both species, to Philenus spumarius and Philenus campestris, what we find is that there are differences on the abundance and presence of the adults in the different subsampling units, which are the cover, the canopy, and the border. In the case of Philenus spumarius, they are present more or less in all these three subsample units, cover, canopy, and border. Meanwhile, if you check for Neophilenus campestris, the presence, and uh, please uh, have attention to the orange one, if you check the trees, on trees on the canopy, Neophilenus espumarius is almost absent from, from, from that subsample unit that may have implications on the secondary transmission, as you know. And there are also differences between the two species if we consider the presence of the vectors in the different crops. And as you can see here, we represent the total abundance of captures in the three crops, olive, almond, and vineyard. And you can, if, as you can see here, Fibelenus spumarius is much more abundant than Neophilenus campestris in the three crops we were sampling during the three years of the project. With this, I finish with the microcons, and then we start with the with the micro. In this case, for the microcons, what we started was uh, some kind of uh, setting up a nice house for the insects where they can just develop during the whole uh, cycle. So we just use this type of cages. We put it inside. Uh, um, different type, different species of plants, Rosmarinus, Pistacea, Osinum, Menta, etc., etc., also with some grass, just to keep a nice environment for them to mate, to the female to lay the eggs, and then we follow all the development of the nymphs and the adults until uh, the end. So uh, I just plotted here, for the sake of time, just the results from one of the species that was the best for the development of uh, Philenus spumarius and Philenus campestris, that was Rosmarinus officinalis. And as you can see here, we 
quietly replicated the results we obtained uh, from the field. We were even more accurate than from the field because in February we already observed NIMS, which are really difficult to observe on the field on, on February, for example. And I just want to end comparing what would be the better role of Philenus, Spumarius and Neophilenus compressors, taking into account all the results we obtained during these three years. And I'm going to rate somehow Philenus Spumarius and Neophilenus campestris. For example, Spumarius is very abundant, the nymphs, while Neophilenus campestris is not so abundant. The nymphs of Philenus uh, Spumarius are really polyphagous, not really polyphagous, the ones of Neophilenus campestris. Philenus uh, Spumarius are really abundant, Neophilenus, it is not. Both adults are very polyphagous. It's an important difference as well about the presence of the adults in the canopy that makes Philenus primaris more abundant in the canopy. And if you check the poster from uh, Julia Mercadal, you will see that both groups uh, are uh, very good in transmitting uh, Shalela and also the the, uh, pr the prevalence of better we find in uh, in the field are very similar. They are between 20, 10 and 20 percent positive to Shalela. So according to our results, uh, we can say that relatively, Lenus spumarius plays a major role in the transmission of Shalela in the Balearic Islands for uh, particular crops. Meanwhile, uh, Neophilenus probably is not such as effective because of the abundance and also because it is not present, for example, in so abundantly in crops such as Venegia. So this is the last slide. I want just to thank very much the support from ESA and also from uh, Giuseppe Stancanelli and Evelina Chevinchek, also thanking uh, Domenico Bosco for all the, all the uh, help he provided and finally to some of the collaborators of the project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikael. Thank you for thank both Mark and uh, Mikael for for the talks. And uh, so now it's time for questions. Um, and there are a few uh, inside the, the chat box. And uh, the first one is really for uh, for for Mark. And uh, uh, says excellent talk. Thank you. How could you re your results affect peer's disease recovery in winter? Uh, that, 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 that's a great question, and and, and, I, and I I think the issue is is that um, you know you know w w w winter recovery is something we know that happens. I mean I I, I have colleagues who do experiments with it. Uh, the, the 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 issue is is that is that the primary paper that that was written on winter recovery in grapevines. The field sites that they used in California were, I, I think, 250. The, the closest field site was 250 to 300 miles, I think, north of this particular location. Um, and, and, and there is very limited overwintering recovery information for that location. And, and, and at least the data that is available says, suggests that it's fairly limited. Uh, but that, 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 that's an area where we desperately need uh, more, more information to understand how it's operating. Thank you. Um, and also another question for Mark. Do you think that primary and secondary inoculations that tend to occur in different time periods are equally effective in infecting systemically grapevine plants? Um, I honestly, I'm not certain. I, 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 I think at the end of the day, my, 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 I, I have the unfortunate feeling that, that, that there's simply just no good time to have a glass ceiling sharpshooter in your vineyard in that area. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that piecing apart, which, which you know, if, if that little window before that imidacloprid go, application goes on, and which which is actually more important is going to be difficult. Uh, um, but at the end of the day, I think it would be better to just have none. The, the real trick is how do you do that? Okay. Um, and I have, I have a question for uh, Mikael. Um, yes. I just, yeah. Just you, yeah. So you you looked at the. Um, I understand that you looked at the effector abundance. Um, I'm also wonder whether the effector of the effector abundance is varying on the different plant species, including olive, over time. 
Uh, yes, I mean, if you refer to the to the olive and just in particular to the canopy, um, we we find the same pattern. Uh, the adults are present just in summer, and then they they move to the cover plants again in in autumn. I mean, this is uh, quite the similar pattern in all places, uh, but for example, not in Corsica, as as I as I heard uh, on the um, Monday or, or Tuesday, uh, one speaker of Corsica, he was she was not mentioning this migration of filenus from one uh, from the cover plants to the trees and so on. So that would be the, the typical pattern, but not apparently not in all the Mediterranean areas. No, so you would say that uh, the abundance is equally high in olive and vegetation around in the olive. It's not necessary that they migrate to the olive. Uh, well, uh, we found the migration. Yeah, you found the migration. Yes, yes, yeah. we found the migration. So the, the adults are just in the olive trees for a period of time and then they move, move in back. summer and okay. in autumn to other plants. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And also for Mikael, uh what are the plant species at the border of the plots yeah the uh, the border of the plot of the plots basically are um um olive tree wild olive trees and um mastic pistacea lentiscus these are the most common plants at the borders and of course during the during the period that there are cover plants, you may find a high variety of plants from different families, uh, Composite or uh, Poacea and so on, that then they disappear during the summertime. Okay. Uh, I have a question for Mark again. So what is the lifespan of the classifying sharpshooter? How will this influence the transmission from fall to spring vineyards? Oh. So, so, so uh, life, lifespan of adults, I mean, in, in the lab, it, it's, it's really long, um, uh, you know, uh, hun, hun, hundreds of days. Uh, I, 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 can't, I can't remember off the top of my head how long we've gotten to live, but I mean, it's, you know, you know I, I, I think we, we've usually pushed six months on, on having them in the lab. Um, uh, so again, they do they do overwinter as adults. So that the adults that emerge in, in you know sep September and October, those those are the ones that are going to lay eggs the following spring. So they they, they are a very long lived species. So I have also another question from Mark. Uh, so I guess on the in the sticky traps, you mostly look for sharpshooters, um, and probably only the uh, the classy wing sharpshooter. However, my question is whether. You have also monitored other insects, uh, 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 the abundance of other insects simultaneously on these sticky traps. So, 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 so uh, on, on the sticky traps, no, 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 yeah. they're they're just mo monitoring gla glassy wing with those uh, pri yeah. primarily because it's an invasive insect. There, 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 are, there are at least uh, two other native ve vectors that are found um, in the San Joaquin Valley: the the, the green sharpshooter and, and the red-headed sharpshooter, but in uh, we did not see any of those in that area. Okay. And then again for Mikael. Uh, yep. Um, what uh, is expected in areas without cover? Uh, in, in areas without cover, do you um, did you find the same number of insect factors, or uh, do they move to the borders? Uh, well, actually, uh, we we were not sampling in in uh, farms or plots that were without any cover. So we included in this project mm -hmm. always plots with cover. But I can tell you from our experience, uh, sampling in plots without cover that is uh, almost a waste of time. At least in our area, the abundance of vectors is uh, dropping dramatically. So as as Martin was mentioning before, the cover for Philenus spumarius in the in the southern countries is is a critical point. Okay, that's really informative. And then I think we have uh, time for one uh, more question, and I see one uh, appearing for Mikael. Um, you mentioned high abundance of Philenus spumarius within the vineyards. Were they found on the grapevine or more likely on the ground cover uh, herbaceous, herbaceous plants? 
And well, where did you we, name adults or both? <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, for the for the names for sure they are present in the cover of the vintages, no problem. For the adults, they are also present there. And my comparative works with Neophilenus pomarius, we uh, as far as we are using the sweeping net, we are not paying attention if they are feeding or not, to be honest. But the abundance of Neophilenus in the vinegar is very low, extremely low. So if the vinegars get infected by Shilela, the only vector that I think may play a role is Philenus pomarius, so they feed for sure on vinegar. So they do feed on, 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 on grapevines? I, I think so, yes, yeah. positively. Yeah. All right. Okay, That's all, that was a question as well. So, okay, well, let's... It, as I, do you see other questions in the chat that I have not captured? So please answer them uh, in the chat then or, or um, by writing them. And I thank both speakers for the, for the talk and really enjoy them and hopefully the audience as well. Thank you. So welcome back everyone. Uh, we are uh, going to welcome our next speaker. We is Gianni Giglioli from the University of Brescia in Italy, and he's going to tell us about modeling population dynamics of the meadow spittle bug. So Gianni, the floor is yours. If you can share your screen with us, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yes, we do. If you can move to yes. full screen mode, yeah. Yes, I'm doing. Okay, so good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity to present you the, the result of this uh, collaborative work that involved the people from my university uh, and from the University of Turin it, here in Italy. So uh, we work on, on the development of a mechanistic or uh, process-based model describing the population dynamics of the middle hospital bug. So this is an important vector we know of a disease and uh, uh, knowing elements of the local disease dynamic uh, is important to put knowledge into this uh, uh, disease triangle. And we know that the vector population abundance influence the transmission rate and also the disease spread over different spatial scales. And in turn, the vector dynamics is influenced by uh, aspect of the environment, both abiotic and biotic environment, contributing to the heterogeneity and complexity of the epidemiological patterns. What is the meaning of developing a process-based approach? Basically, and differently from the correlative approach we have seen in the afternoon in a previous presentation, uh, the idea is to uh, use the available knowledge, the basic biological mechanisms related to the demography of a species, uh, described at the individual level and translate or better summarize this information into a peace state approach describing such as the population dynamics as a whole. Uh, this first step is, uh, is uh, related to the conceptualization of the life history strategies, uh, meaning uh, describing the development, the diapose, the mortality and the fecundity at individual level, dependent on environmental variables, possibly uh, the basic one that is the temperature, but also others, and also the physiological age of the insect. All these uh, elements described mathematically are integrating in, into a model a p-state model. So uh, we faced uh, some important methodological issues in in uh, in uh, describing mathematically the life history strategy of these species. It's relatively simple dealing with immature stages and uh, rearing them in climatic chambers, but less simple follow this long uh, adult stage and the fecundity. This is because we split the approach in two. We developed a cohort-based analysis in, in order to describe the development and mortality rate of the uh, pre-adult stages. And we also used the model to describe these two uh, development and mortality functions. 
And on the other side, we used an individual level approach to describe the fecundity rate and describe this function by a bidimensional uh, rate uh, function. We were able to describe two models. One is the phenological model, describe the phenology of the species, and then the other one is the demographic model that is still under uh, development. So I will present him uh, today only the result on the phenology. This is uh, the model. Uh, it's a partial differential equation model in which uh, describe the change in population abundance, both over time and over the physiological age. The model is moved by these three uh, boxes. So this is the development rate function, this is the mortality rate function, and this is the fecundity. You see these functions are related to environmental variables. In this case, uh, the simplest and more informative one, the temperature. The um, fecundity is also related to physiological age, but you can develop any kind of curve related to both abiotic or biotic information available from the environment. Uh, we derived information on the biology, performing uh, experiments on the development and survival of cohorts. We considered four, uh, five different temperatures, 10 degrees, 18, 24, and 30, with nine replicates per temperature, um, inoculating uh, host plants by an, a variable number of X, uh, and following the dynamics at each temperature of this cohort developing over time. So, for the fecundity rate, as uh, we have seen before, we use the same protocol that Miguel Angel uh, Miranda showed. And within these cages, a couple of male and female were followed in order to reconstruct the, the pattern of fecundity and survival. We also use field data from a procurement financed by EFSA in order to derive information on the phenology and population abundance. The population phenology and abundance uh, were analyzed in four olive orchards in 2016, 17, and 18. The results, um, by combining uh, experiments and uh, modeling activity, we were able to describe the development rate function interpolating experimental points, these red dots, uh, by this uh, real function. And uh, the same, we were able to uh, reconstruct the survival pattern from which we derived the mortality rate function. This is a bathtub function that is quite common used in uh, um, an attempt to describe the survival at different temperature. Both the uh, development rate function and the uh, survival and mortality rate function are stage specific. So the, the model uh, developed was applied in terms of calibrating uh, the information derived from the experimental setup. We used the phenology at four sites. We randomly selected the, the seven uh, sites that could provide good information. So two are in Liguria, in Northern Italy, and two in Apulia, in Southern Italy, for two years. Uh, one information uh, was lacking from the experiment uh, was the how to describe the diapose. So we know from, from literature different uh, proposals in terms of interpreting the, the thermal requirements for uh, exit from the diapose. We started from the work from Kimiel in that uh, proposed 120 degree days with a threshold of uh, 6.5 degrees. In our model, the best results were obtained uh, using a five uh, degrees of uh, threshold, but with the same degree days accumulation. This is an important result because uh, this uh, five degrees is the same uh, temperature threshold, the lower temperature threshold that we have described in our experimental setup. So the model were also preliminary validated using other three uh, um, population uh, dynamics at three different sites, uh, two in uh, um, Liguria and one from Apulia. 
I'm quite satisfied by the result. You, you can see this is not uh, easy to describe this phenology where you have five stages, five uh, immature stages and info stages that are quite uh, uh, close in terms of the time period that uh, they uh, use for development. And I'm also quite uh, happy about the result on how we are able to interpret the, the, the exit from the diapose, the winter diapose. Now some concluding remarks. Okay, this is, was just an exploration of the life history strategy from the experimental point of view. Uh, but uh, uh, combining this exploration with advanced methodological uh, method, we were able to derive a uh, rate function at different temperature, uh, providing in this way uh, the possibility to describe the population dynamics at any temperature. And we were able to observe how the model was uh, um, uh, described correctly the phenology of the species, uh, despite the limited data set, of course, uh, uh, the model required a, a wider replication in different environmental condition and testing other climates, particularly for testing our interpretation of the thermal requirement and the threshold for uh, exit to the, uh, from the winter diapose. We are still working on improving the model in terms of adding the fecundity. You have seen that the fecundity is described as a bidimensional function in which also the, um, the, the, the age of the adult is important. We know that we have a parapose in the first period and then we have the fecundity period. And it's very much important to describe how the fecundity um, relates to time and temperature and uh, physiological age of the adults. Another important step we are considering is to introduce how the population is regulated by the density uh, to account for competition, but also to the plant resources that are available in a given place. Uh, what are the potential use of this model? For sure, the model is ready to describe the phenology, both at local level or at U level, so a different uh, level of resolution, because the resolution of the model depends on the resolution of climatic information, or better meteorological information, because it's a model that also supports the forecast of the phenology. The same is for population abundance. Here, the complexity is uh, higher, because uh, other factors uh, have to be included, particularly the availability and the type of plants. And uh, the availability of uh, information on the phenology and population abundance and their dynamics over space and time could uh, contribute to uh, testing uh, epidemiological and management scenario using model for the epidemiology of CLL system. I would like to uh, I thank also other colleagues that have contributed to our work, Boscia, Cavalieri, Di Serio, Don Giovanni, Saponari, and the financial support we have received from EFSA uh, in this contract collect data from literature and field observation on biology and life cycle of vectors and potential vector foxidella fastidiosa in you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Gianni. You even save some minutes, so that, that's yes, perfect. Yes, I've seen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for this interesting uh, talk. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to welcome our uh, first uh, young researcher, who is Joyce Adriana Froza from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil who is going to share with us her work on the transmission of Xylella uh, poca to olive trees uh, by uh, common vectors in uh, Brazil. So Joyce, the floor is yours. So we can see your screen, but we can't hear you for now. You hear me? 
Yes, we hear you perfectly. Can you switch to full screen mode, please, for your slides? Okay. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, good evening. Today, I will present a part of my research that is about transmission of Sarella fastidiosa subspecies palca to olive trees by sharpshooter and spilly bugs common in Brazil orchards. Sarella fastidiosa subspecies polka has been isolated from the olive trees, showing olive quick decline syndrome symptoms in different locations of surface Brazil. There is a large diversity of sharpshooter spiral bugs that are considered potential vectors of the bacteria in olive orchards. In this work, we evaluated the competition of predominance species of sharpshooter spiral bugs as a vector of Sarella fastidiosa to olive to olive. For that, we first realize transmission biocides. We used insects collected in the graduation vegetation of the olive orchards and also the creation of the laboratory. Then we transfer the insects for the periwink to the pretest assay. Then the insects were transferred to olive plant sources of Sarella fastidiosa. And lastly, the insects were transferred for a healthy olive plant. After a period of six months to one year, was done the detection of Sarella fastidiosa by real time PCR. As results, we obtained 14 species able to transmit Sarella fastidiosa to olive trees. Estimated transmission rates by single insects range from 0 0.4, 0 0.4 between to any point to 9 percent, where the species Pogonara paula showed the greater efficiency with 12 uh, to any point 9 percent, and the species Oragua ECP1 showed lower efficiency with the zero. 0.4%. Uh, these are the vector species for you know them. It's very beautiful. Uh, uh, this efficiency index are the low in the relation of the grape vine strains, but that are more simulation to palco strains in citrus and the cough plants. In conclusion, 14 of it to any species test transmitted Sarella fasciosa to olive trees. Transmission rates by single insects range from 0.4 between to n.9 percent. Among the vector species, Scopogonia paula, Erythrogonia foenicia, and Macogonia caprons are the most abundant in the analyzed areas. This information is important for the definition of vector-oriented control. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank you in particular for the FAPESP uh, and the European Union Foundation for Research and Innovation, CISEF Actors. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Joyce. You are perfect on time. You even saved some minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for this uh, uh, travel in uh, Brazil. So I'm going to leave the floor for Saskia for the last two speakers. Yes, uh, we have two more young researchers. And uh, the next talk is going to be given by Sofia Delgado Serra from the University of the Barrack Islands and um, uh, Dana Barcoding and Genetic Diversity of the uh, Stellella fasciosa factors. Uh, Sophia, we leave the floor to you. 
And your slides are shown, you just need to put it on uh, presentation mode. And the moment we don't hear you, but I guess that will change. You need to go down uh, at the bottom. There is this uh, uh, this 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 panel. You need to go to the right. Can you see that? No. Now you need to go to the bottom of the slide. Oh, hello. <clears throat> hello. Sorry for this. Um, you had your slide but... show up, but on the bottom is a little panel. And then you can see the four, uh, four icons and you have to go to the right. Yes. Can you see the slide? See that one? Yes. Voila. Right. Yeah. And you hear oh, you too. Okay. So fire, fire off. Thank you very much for the okay. introduction. Well, hi everybody. My name is Sofia Delgado Serra and uh, I am part of the Applied Zoology and Animal Conservation Research Group here at the University of the Balearic Islands in Spain. Our research started in 2017 when we obtained a grant from the EFSA and one of the main objectives was to study the molecular ecology of Chalula fastidiosa vector insects here in the Balearics. So we started sampling to all the islands in Mallorca, Menorca, Ibiza and Formentera. <coughs> Sorry. Once in the laboratory, we separated the thorax of each animal to perform a DNA extraction and amplification of two DNA fragments, the cytochrome oxidase 1 and the cytochrome B. After sequencing, we blasted the cytochrome oxidase 1 sequences against the ball system database in order to check the identity of each insect. Then we aligned all sequences using column code aligner. We performed phylogenetic uh, trees, well, maximum likelihood phylogenetic trees using IQ3 software, using both our samples and those available at GeneBank. And finally, we performed haplotype networks using Popart software. We confirmed the identification of 340 Philenotus pumerius and 139 Neophilinus campestris using the DNA barcoding approach. And interestingly, we found that more than half of the samples showed heteroplasmy. I mean, in the chromatograms, there were double peaks in some specific positions, both in Philonus pumerius and Neophilonus campestris, and in both DNA fragments. I have to say that this is not a new finding, as previously have been reported by other authors. And for the further analysis, we could only use that not non heteroplasmatic uh, sequences. Regarding the uh, phylogenetic analysis, the systematic position of Philonosus pumerius from the Balearic Islands were recovered close to those sequences from Jimbank from North America and Italy. Here, here in this haplotype network, we demonstrate the existence of a main cytochrome oxidase 1 haplotype with distribution in Mallorca and Ibiza. Here you can check the color of each island. In addition to other seven exclusive minority haplotypes, either from Mallorca and Ibiza. The genealogical analysis of the cytochrome B genes revealed a great geographical structure marked by the existence of two main haplotypes. The first one um, recovered samples from Mallorca, Ibiza and Formentera, and the second one from Mallorca and Minorca. In addition to other 11 haplotypes with less representation exclusive to Mallorca, Ibiza and Menorca. 
On the other hand, Neophilinus campestris from the Balearics showed a phylogenetic position close to those samples from Greece available at GMAC. The haplotype net networks show the existence of a main cytochrome oxidase 1 haplotype with distribution in Mallorca and Ibiza and other four exclusive haplotypes from Mallorca. Regarding the cytochrome B gene, three haplotypes were identified, two of them exclusive to Mallorca and the third one exclusive to Ibiza. And to sum up, the identification of the Chalela fastidiosa, fastidiosa index were confirmed using the DNA barcoding approach and those species were Phelinus spomerius and Neophilinus campestris. According to previous studies, these insects showed heteroplasmy. The molecular markers used in this study allowed identification of different haplotypes and also geographical structure has been detected. And finally, we have found haplotypes shared between nearby islands and other haplotypes that are exclusive to certain areas. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sophia. Um, thank you for that. That was uh, very filling and uh, informative. And then uh, swiftly go on to the last talk and exactly in time. I'm very happy with that. And that's um, uh, the talk from uh, Christina Camerio uh, at um, uh, Centro di Fasticatio de Montagna. Um, and uh, she will be talking about microbial assemblages within Filenus fumarius and uh, their possible role in insect reproduction. Christina. Yes, everything is fine. Yes. So thank you so much for the introduction and also for the opportunity to present my. Uh, Christina, work. you're a bit uh, soft. You need to talk louder or sit not closer okay. to your microphone. Can you hear me better? Uh, you no? maybe have to yell a little bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I will do a brief pre presentation about my uh, my research project, is, which is microbial assemblages within Philanus pomirus and their possible role on the insects reproduction. Um, uh, so, Xylella uh, fastidia, uh, as we know, it's transmitted by insect vectors, and Philanus pomarius has been confirmed as a vector of the bacterium. Um, as we also know, this combination led to the olive quick decline syndrome, um, and one of the ways to slow or stop the spread of the bacteria is to act on the on the transmission vector. And um, we know that the, my the microorganisms that colonize the internal tissues of insects are important players in the insects' reproduction, nu nutrition, and fitness. And with, with this in mind, uh, this project has two objectives, being the first one, the isolation of my microorganisms in habitat, head, abdomen, and genitalia of Philanus pomarius, and uh, the second one to evaluate the effects of these isolates in host fitness and physiology by using a model insect, which is Drosophila melanogaster. For the objective one, we collected uh, adults Philanus pomarius, and uh, we proceed to surface sterilize them 
followed by organ dissection. We separated the head, abdomen, and genitalia. And then we used them uh, for the isolation of bacteria and fungi. These microorganisms were cultivated and uh, clearly identified. Uh, for the results, in terms of uh, bacterial co community, the three organs are distinct, um, being the head dominated by a Rhizopiaceae, the abdomen by Curtobacterium, and genitalia by Psyllomonas. Um, the genitalia was also the organ with the highest colonization frequency. In terms of fungi, the head and, ge and genitalia were similarly, but the abdomen was distinct. But uh, all three organs were dominated by the genus Calabosporin. Um, the abdomen was the organ uh, with the highest colonization frequency. Uh, for the objective two, uh, we selected some bacterial isolates and we uh, inoculated some uh, drosophila uh, food with this bacterium and we added two couples of flies per flasks and we analyzed their progeny um, along the three gen generations. The parameters evaluated were the, the number of pupae, number of adults, male and female, number of dead larvae, uh, size of the body and wings of adults, also male and female. In terms of results, uh, the parameters evaluated uh, had different uh, results among the three generations uh, for each tested bacteria in relation, of course, to the control. In generally, we had um, two bacteria, the B26 and B27 that generally increase the number of pupae, body size, and wings of adults. Also, the B26 was the one that induced the death of larvae. And on the opposite, we had two, uh, two isolates, that is the B34 and B79, that had the opposite effect and uh, decreases the body size and wings of adults. In terms of conclusion and future perspectives, um, we saw uh, that the bacterial co community was uh, distinct between the three organs and the genitalia was the organ um, that had the highest um, colonization frequency and richness. In terms of fungal community, all the abdomen was distinct between the other organs and also uh, was the organ with the highest colonization frequency and richness. Um, some uh, selected bacterial isolates had either um, a positive or negative effect on the progeny of Drosophila melanogaster. And so, uh, knowing and understanding the Philanus pomeridae microbial com community, it's only uh, the first step to understand their function in the insects' lives. Uh, and also to test them using an organism model can help in their exploitation as a possible management strategy. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Christina. Thank you very much for staying on time as well. Thank you. And I'm really, uh, really happy. Um, uh, for um, starting now the questions and answer session. Uh, however, unfortunately, we haven't uh, that many questions as far as I can see. Yeah. Um, so, so, your talk was very clear, or all of you very clear. Yeah. Um, very so, clear. we have, to be honest, no question for now from the, from the, the, the attendees. So, maybe I have. I have one. Oh, there is one coming here, so maybe it's better if we. Uh -huh. So it's for the. I think it's for the modeling. Oh uh, yeah. So for G, yeah, for G, for Gianni. Um. Yeah. So Gianni, there is a there is a question for you from uh from the, the attendees, and at 
in fact, two questions. So the first one is, how do you explain the scalarity in the Hegg etching? And how do you manage the scalarity for using the model for phenologic predictions? That's the first question. Okay, I try to answer first uh, to the first one. As it's quite common to, to see there is a scalarity uh, when you look at the exit from a given stage. This is due to <clears throat> biological variability. Uh, no matter to account for this because uh, the model is a stochastic model. There is a component described the variability in the development the stages. And of course, uh, this uh, scalarity increases uh, over time when you pass from the X to, to the last uh, nymphal stage. It could also um, be due to a different, uh, a oh, little sorry, bit sorry. of difference. Now, I was adding another uh, possible uh, component to the answer, such as that uh, it could also be that uh, in composing uh, the first inoculum, that in some cases more than 100 individuals, uh, there are some differences in the initial uh, physiological age of the eggs that are put into the, in the, in the experimental step. But this is probably a little part of the variability. I tend to interpret the variability in terms of uh, uh, biological variability in the development rates. And then there is the second part. So uh, it says, do you think possible that other factors other than temperature could affect the population dynamics and in particular phenology and stages appearance? Not, I think. Oh, uh, if we stay on the phenology, I tend to interpret that the temperature is the uh, most important factor. Yeah. Sure, when you describe the variation in number or in survival, uh, availability of uh, the host plant, uh, suitability of the host plant, uh, natural elements and all the other factors play an important role. But if you stay on the phenology, really, the temperature we know is the, the most important abiotic driver um, for, 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 for physiological aspects. Yes. So we know that all the all enzymes are, are strictly related to the temperature, the activity of I, the enzymes. I'm not sure this is being uh, addressed at all, but I wonder if wind is going to be important for the migration. Or the, or the survival of the insects. The wind. Eh? Yeah. Is it any? Yeah. Uh, but okay, for, for sure, wind is addressed when you describe the spread. Uh, in terms of survival, it's very difficult to 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 uh, give a, a a simple answer because the wind per se is not a mortal important mortality factor. Yeah. It depends on. Uh, the type of wind, uh, the altitude where the, the, they travel, uh, and the capacity to establish in the new place, um, per se, is not a problem. All right. Thank you. I actually, yeah, so that, thank you very a, much uh, for answering uh, this uh, question. So, well, yes, I, 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 I have a, yeah, I have a, I have a question for you, Jenny, but it's, it's, maybe a little provocative. I, I was wondering, this is absolutely not my field of research, but I, I was wondering how much time do you think it's going to take for you to be uh, completely satisfied with the model you propose? Because you explained that you need to incorporate well, it, a lot of uh, more I, parameters, regarding... but how much time do you think it's going <laughs> to... How much time do you think it's going to take for you to be completely uh, happy with your model and um, yeah, do you think it's already uh, fine and we can use it for for uh, risk assessment and, and or, or no? Well, this is a complex question, uh, Astrid. Um, I'm not <laughs> completely satisfied at all um, <laughs> for two reasons. Uh, the first is that I only had a limited data set to both parameterize and, and validate the model and also explore the restricted uh, variation in environmental parameters. Uh, we know a uh, few things about how the, the biology could vary according to the attitude. So why this species is, uh, seems to preferring a northern climate and now it's limited by southern climate, southern European climate first. 
but if you consider the risk assessment, the problem is more complex. So uh, when I would develop the, the demographic model in terms of um, uh, being available to describe also the abundance, I also expect that I'm not fully satisfied because uh, you see we are using temperature. This is the first step including the relationship between the species that we are describing and the host plants and other components of the environment could help in providing more realism in the in the uh, in the description of the population dynamics how much time it depends and depends on the availability of data i think that we have done a a, a step ahead in the knowledge of population dynamics summarizing uh, the life history strategy into this uh, tool but this is just a tool. I don't think that it can be used uh, per se like it is now in risk assessment and particularly in quantitative risk assessment because I I'm, I'm, was part of the EFSA uh, working group developed this approach and I tend to consider the modeling component very important if they give us the information we require. But we are on the way. All right. I, 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 I do okay. have questions for Christina, <laughs> if, if, uh, if I may. Uh, so, um, so actually, yeah, for Joyce first. So for Joyce first, um, so I wonder the insect species that you found, uh, to transmit, uh, Silala, how, how, um, how. Uh, common are these globally? Are, are they widespread or are they more uh, specific to the environment that you have investigated? The location? The, 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 the spread of the species globally, how common are the species that you have I, identified as transmitters in, in the world? Are they more specific to your area or are they more widespread as species? <laughs> I collected the species in the Maria da Fé in Minas Gerais. Yes. In the Montequeira Montor Range. Yes. But do you know whether those species are 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 occurring a uh, uh, um, beyond this range or in other countries? Yes, in another in another countries. Yes. No. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. And uh, I have I have another question for you, Joyce. Maybe I have another question for, for you, Joyce. So the vectors, they are you say they are very beautiful, and yes. that's that's right. So they are harmful, but as compared to what we have in Europe, for example, they are they are really nice. And I was wondering, how do you identify them? Do you have uh, keys to identify them? Is it easy or do you have some uh, species complex? I mean, do you have some species that look alike that are very similar or is it, are they all very easy to identify? Uh, I think if I identify these species and then mm, my master projects I have five years identifying species uh sharp shooting the if you hopper in general né? Uh, i have a uh, work with a uh, taxonomy uh, professor né? and i uh, try uh, identify uh, the insects uh, by me né? I have, I use the the keys, and I uh, use the visual uh, pigoffy, the uh, yeah. of him the morphology only the morphology, uh, no 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 more, more, uh, only yes, morphology, yes, no no more no, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, okay, I, uh, but I, I, I like, né, work, uh, with molecular identifying in the future. Yeah. 
Yeah, but this is nice because in Europe, we have less and less taxonomists. I know that in Brazil, we, we you have many students that are working with morphology and that's nice because it takes a long time and that is very important to have that. So congratulations because it must have been a huge work. <laughs> yes, thank you Astrid. And molecular research is nice, but actually you need the species first. So that's most of it. <laughs> so, um, so then uh, I I thought that for Sophia I have a question as well. And um, you were you 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 had uh, you put you made the haplogroups based on two different genes in the mitochondrion. Yes, and I wonder in how far the two uh, your two haplogroup group groupings compare to each other, whether they match each other or whether they quite different from each other. Uh, and maybe just answer that for Fulanus primarius. Sorry, the relation between the two the groups, two... the two genes, because you had two genes and you had you used the two genes to make haplogroups, and I wonder how the two compared to each other. Uh, well, they are here, I mean... And we had more haplogroups in within one gene, but I wonder the, how the, uh, the group is yes, compared. The thing yeah. is that we started uh, working on cytochrome oxidase 1 sequences mm -hmm. because of the barcoding issue. Yeah. And then we wanted to compare with another fragment of the metagenome. So we we keep it, we mm, we started uh, well. I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> Sorry, we started uh, searching on on different articles. We keep in touch with other authors, and the conclusion was to compare with with the, this other one with the cytochrome yeah. B because of. Mm, there are other markers, but they yeah. present some difficulties on working them. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And you and, you, and if you uh, would, uh, so... uh, if you would uh, choose other markers, would you? What would you do? Well, uh, because of the heteroplasmy issue. I would like to continue using these markers and maybe clone the samples in order to study the different variants, but with the same markers. I mean, yeah, to study the, the diversity of these of these mitochondrial variants. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, so, thank uh, you. I have, it's okay. Saskia, I, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I have a, I have a question maybe for for Christina, and then I have yeah. another maybe for Sofia and Christina, because I think your talk are, are um, well. So, for, for mm -hmm. Christina, so if I have well understood, um, you have um, cultivated the microorganism. Mm -hmm. um, and you perform Sanger sequencing, right? Yes. If you have, uh, if you have to, if you have to to redo things, what what do you do? You do you see another um, way of uh, of doing it, like maybe less time consuming? Um. I, I would we... I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. The connection is not very good. So I have, yeah, I'm sorry for interrupting. Please go ahead. Um, since uh, I wanted to isolate and to use them, I think that there, there was no other way of, of, of obtaining the isolates to work with. Um, actually, what we are also doing, it's a method genomic approach to understand the whole community. Yes. So for the fungal, okay. uh, for the fungal to, ones, to, do you have? Uh, do you, did you find also uh, pathogenic ones? 
that that are commonly pathogens for insects? Uh, for for insects, I don't know, but uh, yes, we found yes, yes. Okay, we like Ophelia or something. No. Yes. Uh, no. No. <laughs> no. <Okay>. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and maybe sorry, I think for Sophia and Christina. Oh, sorry. Uh, Stathia, I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you. It's it's fine. No, no, no. I was just inviting yeah. you to yeah. ask your question that you were. If you think, yeah. Okay. So um, I have um, a question for um, Christina and Sophia. Um, do you think that uh, the multiple copy, Sophia, you 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 highlight on your uh, mitochondrial DNA, they may be linked to um, the community of uh, bacterial that are highlighted by uh, Christina. You think they could well, be linked? This To the different. And the question is <laughs> Well, uh, one of the next steps we want to to do in this in this area is to compare the results of the um, microbiology laboratory who are studying and detecting the chelella in these vectors. So we have the information on the, um, I mean, all the insects I have used to do the phylogenetic and the haplotypes net networks. We have the information about if it checked, if it insect, if it was Shailella fastidiosa positive or negative, and we want to, to grab this information in order to know if there is a, some kind of relation between Chalela and the Chalela infection and haplotypes. Was that the question? And and what about what a part of it? And what what about the um, the link between symbionts and the presence of heteroplasts? No, we we are not working on that. On that, sorry. Okay. All right. That's fine. Thank you very much. Yes. All right. Thank you. I, wish, I want to thank all the speakers for staying on time and also for their excellent, for the really interesting talks. I learned much, a lot of from them, um, and especially also from the the young in, young researchers. I think you did a great job. And uh, also for the audience of answering questions and making the discussion fun uh, after the after the talks. Um, and also my co-host, thank you Astrid for co-hosting. And um, and uh, well, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. And uh, there's another uh, nice day of talks coming tomorrow. And uh, yes, so uh, have a great evening. And uh, we uh, see you tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.